How you guys doing? My name is Malcolm McRae, uh, artist, author, entrepreneur. Um, I travel across the country inspiring young people through art and creativity. And I'm here today to be able to share my story about how art saved my life. I just decided to really do a one-on-one -on -one interview with you guys so you guys can get a little bit more understanding of who I am before you understand what I do. So my journey started off at a really young age. I was roughly around eight to 10 years old when I really realized that I wanted to be an artist. And this passion and this commitment and this lifestyle came to me through my father. My father was an art teacher at the Boys and Girls Club in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was raised and born, born and raised. And not only was my dad an art teacher, he was an art teacher in one of the roughest areas in Milwaukee, the projects, public housing, the hood, the ghetto. My dad was an art teacher there in one of the roughest areas. And in my life now as an adult, as a, as a man, and, and as somebody who really cares about inspiring the next generation of artists, I realized why it was so important for him to be an art teacher in an area like that. Something small as caring. Like my dad was the first person that really showed me that. Not only caring, but how art can be used to be able to heal and deal with some of the wounds that these young people are dealing with. Because I, I, I was that young person. So I remember getting off the bus. And this was like a magical place at my dad's, at my dad's job. This is where a place where I could just draw out all of the pain or I can draw out all of the frustration I was dealing with at a young age. See, my dad and my mom was going through a divorce. And it was really painful for me. And I was trying to figure out, was it my fault? Was it, was it, was it their fault? But for some reason, I felt like that this responsibility, this pain, I was causing, causing it. And I can remember dealing with this frustration, this situation deep within inside of myself. And the only way that I can deal with this situation was um, to be able to um, draw it out. Because I was that kid. I was the kid in school that was being disrespectful and disruptive in class. And everybody, see guys, at a young age, I was, I was, I was labeled with attention deficit disorder. I was that kid that was in back of the, uh, of the class throwing paper, being disruptive. But an art teacher, somebody came to me that seen something that was bigger than being a disruptive kid and gave me an opportunity to be able to deal with some of my emotions and some of my pain. And it was only through art. I wouldn't be here to this day if it wasn't for those, those times in my life. So I'm an 80s baby, born in 1980. And I was still drawn, but I wanted more. I wanted something else. I wanted to take my art form to the next level. I didn't know how to do that. And I remember walking to the mall, through the mall and I see this guy airbrushing t-shirts. And it was the first time that I had seen street art being put on different surfaces. And instantly I knew that I wanted to do, this is something that I wanted to do, was, do, was do, become an airbrush artist. So I took all of my drawings, I went home, I took all of my drawings, compiled them into like a portfolio as a kid. I didn't know what a portfolio is. I just took all of my little work. And I just remember feeling so prideful. Going up there, you know, showing this guy my work. He starts to go through the papers. And uh, he's taking his time. So, yes, I aced it. I already, it's, it's, already, it's already in the hole. I knew it. And he um, totally just destroys and crushes my whole dream by telling me, your work is great, but I just don't really have time to train anybody or babysit anybody's kid. And I'm gonna I'm be honest, I was heartbroken. Um, I mean, it's the first time where I had to really deal with rejection, you know, in my work and, you know, something, somebody telling me no. And so I had to make a decision. I could move forward on something that I really wanted to do or give myself excuses to be a victim or a casualty 
And let me let me clear this up. Where I come from is Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This is one of the most roughest segregated cities in America. And majority of the people that I grew up with, my friends, um, we talking about people I graduated high school with. When I go back home, um, you realize, and I realize that um, I was going to be a statistic cause, because everybody that I really know, I mean, we're talking about 90% of the people that I probably graduated high school with are incarcerated or dead. And it was, it was at that point in time, I really remember thinking that. I really remember thinking that if I didn't follow with, with my heart and my dreams and my ambitions and my, my soul was telling me that I could easily fall into the, to the trap. That's what we call it. We call it the trap. So, during that whole transition, I was dealing with a lot, too, because here we are. My mom and my dad were, were, break, were, bro were broken up. They were going through a divorce fighting. Um, I'm the oldest out of five. My, one of my little sisters has cerebral palsy. So, I was, a lot of the pressure was on me as the oldest to be able to watch my brothers and sisters while my mom was at work. That, my mom sends me to go live with my dad on the plane, packs up all of my stuff, and we go uh, to the airport, and she puts me on the plane to go live with my dad. So my dad comes to pick me up from the airport. This is in Columbus, Ohio. This is the furthest I have been from home at this time. My dad picks me up in a cab. Remember this, I remember pulling up, you know, we pull up, we roll through the hood, we pull up, and it's a big building on the right side, and reality hit. Me, my dad, and my brother lived in an abandoned building for two years. No electricity, no heat, no running water. I had to make another decision. What else, was I going to go call home and cry, Mom, you know, we ain't got this, or we ain't got that, this and that, or was I going to man up? In the African culture, this is called a rice of passage, when you go from boyhood to manhood. And I knew that my dad wasn't going to send me through anything that I couldn't handle. And I remember that night asking my father, what happened? And my dad told me, this is life, son. This is what you got to go through sometimes, the ups and the downs. On this mission, what I did bring with me is I brought my airbrush, my art materials, and maybe just some clothes. And even though the building was abandoned people didn't know we lived there but it was a bus stop so people would be sitting on the stairs and my dad was like well won't you just set up an easel on the stairs and while they sitting there they can be start buying your shirts as we were homeless me my father and my brother had one vision and one dream and that was to be able to create a business where we lived upstairs from our shop and downstairs we ran a family oriented business that was our number one dream when we would sleep on this cot at night, we would look up into the ceiling and that was our vision and our dream. I just remember that somebody was knocking on the door. We didn't have a phone. And it was one of the, the employees that worked at the corner store that my dad worked at. So he, he's, he's coming to get my dad. My dad goes down and leaves for a couple hours. He comes back and tells uh, me and my brother that my mom um, is in the hospital. Um, and she had... Um, a blood clog in her lung. So of course we're like, okay, well, you know, she's gonna be all right. And um, the reality is, is my mom died. And immediately we hopped on the plane to get to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to take care of um, the, the girls. I got three little sisters. We get there, and I had to make another decision. Was I gonna continue on with my vision? At 17 years old. I created a business called Showtime Wild Image, where, we, where me, my dad, and my brother um, found this building where we had a storefront downstairs and living quarters upstairs. At 17 years old, I created this business where we was making over $150,000 a year off of doing airbrush and screen printing, but it was a catch. 90% of the work that I was doing was built around memorial t-shirts, death shirts. For you guys who don't know what that is, in a black and a Latino community, 
we have a thing where we do these t-shirts where we take photos print them out on a t-shirt and we have these memorial sayings and love and memory my cousin my homie my little brother different things like that so here I am a young creative guy I was making a lot of money a lot of money but something wasn't right I was spending 90% of my business 90% of my time dealing with death I had to realize that my whole goal, my whole nature was built around art and creativity, which is an uplifting spirit. I had to make a decision. I knew what it meant to have money on that aspect of it. But I didn't know what true success was. So I made an oath with God to focus in on living, creating, and inspiring. So I travel across the country, inspiring young people all across the country, showing them how to be able to take something as simple as a tool, an airbrush, to give them hope and inspiration and creativity. Showing them how to be able to take that balance that I didn't have at that time and apply that to real life success. So what I do is, I use these different tools, hip hop, humanity, history, to be able to, to incorporate these different tools together to make that connection with these young people. Because guess what? We're losing the next generation of creative professionals. Not because of the schools, not because of parents, because we are teaching our children to dream. To dream.